In this video, we'll take a look at three simple ways to optimize your HLSL code. We'll start off by creating a brand new material, and I'll just call that M underscore HLSL test optimize. And what I'm going to do is just make a material that has a custom node that we can start using. And we're going to want to connect that custom node up to a texture coordinate node and set that input as the UVs, so UV. And before I start typing any code, I'll open up Visual Studio Code so you can see the code that I'm typing a little bit easier. And we'll just make a simple pattern that we can test some optimizations out with or test some different ways of, of doing some optimizations. So I'm just gonna make a circle that changes color as it spans outwards. And to do this, we'll create a float two called center. This will be our center point, uh, which will be the center of the UV. So it'll be 0 0.5 for U and 0 0.5 for V. And then what we'll also do is define um, the distance from the center. So I'll make another variable called distance, and that will be our distance of the UV space from the center. So there we go, distance from the center. And then finally, we'll define uh, three colors. So I'll define red, green, and blue. So I'll do color red, or color R equals color red. And I'll do the same thing for green and blue. So I'll go in here and just make this green and then blue. And change this to green, or G, and then B. So there we go. And then I'll make another variable um, for our storage of our final color. And then what we can do is something we've been doing a lot, using a branch or an if statement to threshold out these values. And that's that's one thing that we can start to optimize. I know some people have mentioned it in the comments before, which is great. It's probably one of the easiest ways to speed up your HLSL materials is to avoid using branches to use something like a min, max, or a step, or something instead that's an operation rather than a branch or an if statement. So we'll take a look at how we can optimize that. But let's first type this out in a way it's easy to understand, which is why I use these branches uh, for these videos. For people who are newer to HLSL or coding, it makes it easy to grasp. Um, whereas changing it into an operation starts to change a little bit the way you have to think. So let's first try it this way. So if the distance is less than 0 0.2 from the center, then what we're gonna do is make the color equal color red. And then we're gonna do the same thing for another color, but now it's gonna be else if. So else if the distance is smaller than 0 0.4, well then the color is going to be maybe color G, green. And then if it's some other distance, we'll just make the color equal color blue. And then finally, we'll return the color. Now, before we copy this code into Unreal, I've noticed our color here is a float, not a float three. It needs to be a float three if we want it to have color. So we'll make that slight change. And then we're gonna copy all this, go into Unreal, paste it into our custom node, and there we go we have our circle that changes colors as it spans outwards. So pretty easy to do. So how can we optimize this? We should first understand why these if statements or branches cause the GPU to slow down or not be as optimized or as performant. And the reason is GPUs are meant to do a lot of things at once. They're meant to do a lot of operations at once. So by having these if statements or these branches, it causes a lot of those threads to wait or pause. And this hurts the performance. So it's more performant if we can do a lot of operations on everything all at once very quickly. And a way of doing that would be to turn this if statement into a step operation. So to easily turn this if or else if statement or these branches into a step operation, we really need to understand what's actually going on. So the first thing is let's try to simplify this as much as possible. I'm just gonna go in here, I'm gonna return color, but I'm gonna wipe out this whole if statement or this branch, and I'm just going to make the color equal one. 
And that's going to be really simple. If the color equals one, I know it's a float three, but that will just populate all channels of it or all those three spots with just one. So if we copy that and put that back into Unreal, it just outputs uh, white. So what we can understand right here is every UV or every pixel on this UV is just outputting a red, green, blue value of one producing the white color that we see. So let's think of it that way. Let's kind of make this a bit more simple to understand. Let's think of our UV space as just a bunch of rows and columns of cells, which will be the pixels, and they all just have values that determine their color. So when we do something like this, everything just has all those cells, all those rows, all those columns just have a value of one. And for simplicity, if we think of that texture as just like 16 rows and 16 columns, and we're just filling each of those rows or columns or each of those pixels with a value of one, this is what it might look like if we were to display the, the actual values as numbers. So that's kind of easy to understand. So how can I threshold out from the center outwards and populate it with different colors? Well, we need to find a way of making a mask that goes around those different distances. So that's where we can start writing a step function. So a step function is really simple. And I'm just gonna go back to the code here. And if we think of a step function, I'm just gonna type this in step and it'll do something like one and then two. So what does step one and then two do? So the step function is really just a comparison. It takes the first value and the second value and checks to see if the second value is greater or equal to the first value. So if we have something like color equals step one and then two, two is greater or equal to one, so it should return one. So if we were to copy all this and put this into Unreal, it should still give us the color white. Now, if that second value was less than one, like 0 0.9, well, then it's going to return zero. So it's really just a comparison. The step is really just a comparison uh, operation. So if we were to do something like color equals, and then maybe just fill everything with white, one, and then we minus a step operation, of however big we want to make that red circle in the middle, so 0 0.2, and we compare the distance from the center point of the UV as what we're checking against that 0 0.2, so distance. So it's going to check the distance of each kind of part of the UV, and if that part of the UV is greater or equal to a point two distance, then it's gonna return one. If it's less than that distance, it's gonna return zero. So if we were to think up of this, just this step function or operation as colors throughout our UV space, based on that value, either white or black, we'd end up with something like this where all those parts that are near the center of the UV end up being zero because the distance is less than that value that we have there of 0 0.2. So if we have something like this, but then we are minusing it from just solid values of one, if we think of what happens there, so if we take this corner as an example, by default, everything's filled with one. And then we have this step operation, which will compare and output ones or zeros, or a mask essentially, based on the distance. And then we're minusing all that from our value of one. It'd be like one minus one. And what's my one minus one? Well, that would end up becoming zero or black. And then in the center here, if you took these values of one and you minus zero, well, then they stay as one. 
So essentially what this is going to do, essentially what this operation we have here is going to do is produce a mask where all the center points that we see here, the center areas, stay as a value of one and everything else goes to black. You could even just take this step function and invert it, but I think this is an easy way. Just fill everything with one and then minus this. And if we do this in practice here, so if I take this code, and we go and pop this into Unreal. What ends up being our output? It's a mask where that center of the circle is masked out or thresholded out. So now all we have to do is color it or tint it. And that's really easy to do because if we multiply anything by one, you'll just inherit the color values. So if I do something like color red, multiplied by that black and white map, that area where it was white will just become red now. So if I do something like that and put that in here, now we have a red circle. So now that we know how to do this, we can just continue doing that to do the rest. So we can keep adding on, on top of it and just making it all one consistent operation. So next we could do uh, color green. So color green, so we take our first color red, then we plus color green. But then what do we do? We don't start with one. We're not populating everything with a, a value of one. We start off from where we left off. So we're going to start off from step 0 0.2. And then we're going to minus or continue and draw this green all the way up to step 0 0.4. Like that. And then we'll add the next thing. And the next thing that we'll add is the color blue, the most outer ring. So color blue, and we start at maybe 0 0.4. We end at 0 0.6. And then if there's some sort of color we want beyond that, maybe I'll just reuse the, the blue again. But if we want to do some value beyond that continuing forever, then we just define a starting value or a starting point. So step 0.6. And then it just goes on beyond that with whatever this color is. So this is what we end up with now. And if we were to take all this code, place it back into Unreal, we end up with what we had originally, but we've bypassed using any sort of branch or if statement and just use uh, one operation with these step operations or functions. Now, another word for this type of optimization is simmed optimization. And that stands for single instruction, multiple data optimization. And it's all about being able to perform operations on multiple data points simultaneously. You're not having to wait for those branches or if statements. You're just going over all the pixels at once and applying this one operation to it. And it's just giving us the result that we need. So this is one way you can really improve the performance some compilers may automatically perform this optimization. So sometimes you might not notice much of a difference or if you know it's a very simple thing like this, the performance is probably not gonna change that much. But keeping things optimized like this do add up. And you know, for mobile games or things that have more of a situation where performance is more important, it can make a big difference. But in general, it's good to kind of practice uh, better coding and better ways and more efficient ways of doing things. Now, some other things that we're gonna take a look at uh, that can also be a little bit more performance friendly in your HLSL materials is to use constant variables. If you have an operation that never has to be updated or changed, and maybe this, is, this will be a bit of a, a silly example, but if I were to have something like, just to define pi, like float, float pi equals uh, 3.14159. That's never going to change. So instead, I could make that a preprocessor definition, or I could make it a constant. And by defining it as a constant, it only pretty much performs that calculation or whatever you're doing in there once. So even if you had something that was like pi, but you need to multiply it by two, this is only going to do that operation once and then keep that value. By defining it as a constant, it won't ever update after it does this first 
calculation or assignment. So that is something that's fairly minor, but it also can make your code a little bit more readable or understandable as well. And then one final thing that could be useful is in most of these videos, you've seen me probably endlessly use floats. And the thing with a float is when you define a variable as a float, and that essentially means it's, it's quite high precision. It supports up to about seven or eight decimal digits, and that might not be needed. If I do something like float uh, color red, maybe even do a float three, float three color red, that's three channels where each channel is a 32-bit float. And that means it supports up to seven or eight decimal digits of accuracy. But if we think about this, when I define the color red, maybe even if I want it to be a, a more specific color, maybe it's not color red, but just some other color, maybe some color. We might have like 0.75 red, 0.45 green, 0.15 blue. We're definitely not using seven or eight decimal places or decimal digits of accuracy. So maybe the float three is a little bit overkill. What I could use is something like a half float, which would be a half three. And if I do a half three, it's the same as a float, but it's pretty much half the bit width. So it's like 16 bits, which means it only has accuracy down to about three or four decimal digits. Well, I'm really only using two decimal digits here, so that's probably more suitable and more within the range of what I need to, to do. So in this case, a half three is essentially more efficient than using a float three. So that's something you also want to do is maybe make sure that your variables are defined as types that have a range that are suitable for what you need, and you're not doing something that's more excessive. If you enjoyed this video or you learned something new, don't forget to like, subscribe, and if you're part of the Patreon, which you can find a link to down in the description below, you also get a PDF with all the steps we went over in this video in a little bit more detail.